Hello and welcome to this educational activity entitled Expert Video Viewpoints on Castration-Resistant Prostate Cancer, Care Across the Continuum. I am Emmanuel Antonarakis, Assistant Professor of Oncology at the Johns Hopkins Sydney Chemo Comprehensive Cancer Center, and I'm joined by Dr. Leonard Gramella, Chairman, Department of Urology, Associate Director of Clinical Affairs, Jefferson Chemo Cancer Center at the Thomas Jefferson University, and Dr. A. Oliver Sartor, the Laborde and Dowd Professor of Cancer Research at the Tulane University School of Medicine. We will now begin with Section 4, Putting Evidence into Practice, Expert Perspectives on Case Examples. And this is one of my favorite sections where we get to talk about three or four cases and see how each of the faculty members will manage them. We'll start with the first case. This is a 57-year-old man with a diagnosis of T3A prostate cancer, Gleason score of 4 plus 4 equals 8, with a PSA of uh, 8.2 at diagnosis. He underwent a radical prostatectomy, but then subsequently had a biochemical recurrence, as we often see with these intermediate and high-risk patients. He was actually started on combined energy blockade with luprolide as well as bicalutamide, had an initial response, but then had PSA, which was rising, with the PSA going from 4.2 up to 5.6 up to 7.2. At that time point, a serum testosterone level was checked to see where that was at. It was 28 nanograms per deciliter, which is in the castrate range. And a bone scan and CT scan done to, uh, for staging purposes revealed no evidence of distant metastatic disease. So I'd like to ask Dr. Gomella, does this patient meet criteria for castration-resistant prostate cancer? Well, if we look at his testosterone level, it's suppressed below what the standard castrate level is of 50 nanograms per deciliter. Um, if we look at his rising PSA, and we put that together, he has castrate resistant or castrate refractory prostate cancer. And this is the type of patient you could tell from his initial presentation that ultimately will have a problem down the line with developing some type of recurrence. Yeah, and so I agree with that. So this is a patient with non-metastatic castration-resistant prostate cancer. Dr. Sartor, how would you think about managing this patient initially? Well, first of all, there are no FDA-approved agents in this particular space. Uh, we might consider a clinical trial if, in fact, we have a clinical trial prime. Otherwise, I think about secondary hormones. So I like to use nilutamide, which is an alternative antiandrogen, or potentially even ketoconazole, hydrocortisone combination or maybe a little low-dose DES. So those type of agents would be what I would use in my practice. Dr. Gamella, anything to add? And also in the urological community, are, are urologists referring these patients to oncology at this point? Or are they managing them themselves? I, I think it depends on your setting. Uh, those of us that work in comprehensive multidisciplinary cancer centers may tend to refer these patients a little bit earlier, particularly for inclusion in clinical trials. Uh, I think in more of the community setting, uh, a lot of urologists are comfortable with looking at other secondary hormonal manipulations in this group of patients, and I think they might try other strategies that have been alluded to before they refer them to medical oncology. Yeah, I would agree with all those points. And you know, for me, this is the ideal patient for a clinical trial. We don't have any standard. The disease is not progressing at a very rapid rate. So a lot of patients also from their end would be willing to go on clinical studies. Um, this particular patient actually did go on a clinical study with TAC-700, which is a CYP17 androgen biosynthesis inhibitor. This was given without prednisone in the phase two study. So this patient received this oral agent, um, had a, actually a nice PSA response for approximately six months. Um, unfortunately, um, despite the attack uh, 700, eventually, as with all these patients, the PSA uh, started rising again, going up from 4.6 to 7.5, up to 11.2. We did check another testosterone level at that time point to see where we were at, and actually the testosterone was further suppressed. It was down to 2 nanograms per deciliter, which is essentially very close to zero, as we do see with the CYP17 inhibitors. And you know, this was a good time to actually restage the patient, repeat the CT scan, repeat the bone scan. Um, the CT scan was fine, it didn't show any evidence of lymph node disease or visceral disease. However, the bone scan did show two suspicious areas. One of them was in the fifth rib, and one of them was in the lumbar spine in the L1 vertebral body. When we asked the patient about symptoms, he was still feeling great, going to work, exercising, no problems, no bone pains. So at this point, we have a patient with metastatic disease, castration resistant, and yet no symptoms. Um, so I'd like to ask Dr. Sartre, how would you think about and manage this patient? Well, you know, it, it, it's interesting. A couple of years ago, we would have had perhaps even more of a conundrum, but now we do have an FDA-approved agent, and that's simple cell T. And uh, this would be actually an ideal candidate for simple cell T. One of the things that you can do and that I do in my practice is I use the CYP-T in combination with some type of secondary hormonal manipulation. So long as it doesn't contain a glucocorticoid, you know, we don't want to suppress the immune system with prednisone or dexamethasone, but we might have a patient on nilutamide or maybe even DES in combination with CYP-T. So that's how I'd approach this patient. 
Dr. Gomel, anything you'd like to add for this kind of patient? No, he's the ideal patient. He fits the absolute FDA indications. I think we all know that, uh, that Medicare now basically says they will pay for sipulucil T, but you have to identify metastatic disease, castrate refractory, and be asymptomatic or minimally symptomatic. So clearly, that would be one very good option for this man. Now, if this patient had been on a steroid, either because of part of therapy or taking it for another reason, we have no evidence to sort of guide us here. But in your practice, how do you feel about combining steroids with Cipulucil T? Do you think this should be a washout period? Can you just reflect on that for us, Dr. Gomala, first? Well, again, as you pointed out, there's no data in this area, and uh, perhaps in the coming years we'll get some more information. But we are very concerned about the, uh, about the steroids and the Cipulucil T combination. So we will try to work with our medical oncologist and have a washout period. Yeah, and you know, for me, this is a patient, again, which for cl I would consider for clinical trials. Uh, many patients may not have access to cipulucil T or may not choose to, to have that kind of therapy. And we have a, a whole um, number of phase three studies actually looking at these patients with uh, asymptomatic or minimally symptomatic metastatic disease. And you know, I can think of um, several studies. For example, we have the TAC-700, which is a placebo-controlled trial in those patients. Um, we have a study with tesquinamide, an immunomodulatory drug uh, for those patients. We also have um, an ipilimumab study of ipilimumab versus placebo for these patients. So there's at least three large phase three studies that I can think of that I'd like to put my patients on you know, if, if they're not eligible, if they don't, are not able to get cipulucil T. So th this patient did receive cipulucil T, and as we mentioned before, this is given as three infusions two weeks apart over a four-week period. He received all three infusions. And as we often see with this agent, it doesn't really produce any PSA declines. This particular patient was warned about that. We had counseled him about it. Three months later, his PSA actually took a rise. Three months after that, six months after his last cipulucil T infusion, PSA was again rising. And at this point, this is where I would normally restage my patients. We did a CT scan, and it shows something very interesting, a para-aortic lymph node about 3.8 centimeters, which was new, which was highly suspicious. And we repeated the bone scan from two lesions. He had gone to five lesions now. He had two lesions in the ribs, two in the vertebral body, one in the pelvic bone itself. When we questioned him about pain, he wasn't sort of forthcoming with it, but on retrospect, he said, you know, it's about a three out of 10. So this is now a patient, in my mind, with a performance status of zero and yet has painful metastatic disease um, with castration resistance. So I would like to ask Dr. Sartor, how would you manage this patient at this time point? Well, at, at this point, I'm really thinking much more about chemotherapy. And in addition, I'm also thinking about bone targeted therapy. So we have a multiplicity of, of bone lesions, we have symptoms, we have progression that is occurring, and we've already probably manipulated a secondary hormones. And quite frankly, I'm thinking about dostaxel for this patient probably uh, as my next step. And Dr. Gomella, if you were seeing this patient, would you sort of treat them yourself as a urologist? Would you refer them to a medical oncologist? Or how would you think through this patient? Well, again, we work in a very uh, congenial, multidisciplinary setting, but taking this patient out into more of the community setting, I think that uh, most urologists really feel uncomfortable, particularly when the patient begins to develop symptoms and uh, begins to have bone pain or other manifestations of metastatic disease. Uh, one point I'd like to expand on is the, the issue about not having a PSA response with Cipulucil T. Uh, and hopefully at some point we'll identify another marker for response, but this is one of the, the limitations that we have because obviously this patient did not have a good response to the Cipulucil T. It would have been nice to know that up front, but again, absent a marker right now, um, we just have to go ahead and empirically treat the patients who meet the criteria for the immunotherapy. And I would agree that this patient is probably looking towards chemotherapy sometime in the near future. One of the concerns I have is if patients have received cipulucil T, if we give them chemotherapy, are we sort of suppressing the beneficial effect of cipulucil T? I think that's an open question. Dr. Sartor, do you have any ideas about this, or have you seen any evidence about this anywhere? Well, well actually, I have seen evidence. So, so Dan Petrolak had, had presented data um, derived from patients who were treated with cipulucil T. And actually, it was kind of interesting. Those individuals who had the prior cipulucil T actually seem to potentially respond even better to the docentaxel. And you know, you might question, well, whether or not we're inhibiting the immune system, but it could be the immune system is enhancing the chemotherapy action. So right now, I do consider it to be an open question. This was not a definitive trial. It was a small subset analysis. Uh, but data has been presented to show that, at least with chemotherapy, you certainly don't respond any worse. I mean, I like that idea of sort of the cipulucil T acting as the immunological prime and then the chemotherapy acting as the boost. I mean, it's a very interesting concept. Mm -hmm. So this patient actually, he did end up receiving docetaxel uh, on the three-weekly regimen. 
He also received denosumab, the rank ligand inhibitor, perfectly appropriate. I think zoledronic acid mm -hmm. would have been equally appropriate as well. Um, he did have a nice uh, PSA response with about 80, 90 percent PSA reduction with the chemotherapy. He also had some regression of the lymph node. Unfortunately, after about eight uh, chemotherapy cycles, he was developing some quite troublesome peripheral neuropathy, uh, about a grade three, and really didn't feel comfortable continuing the, the chemotherapy. We stopped it. Very shortly afterwards, his PSA started to rise again. Um, we did repeat the CT scans, and quite worrisome to me, for the first time I saw a liver lesion, which was not there before, so a true visceral lesion, as well as some small pulmonary nodules that were all less than a centimeter, but certainly concerning bilateral lung lobes there. Um, when questioning the patient, his peripheral neuropathy hadn't sort of had time to recover, still as a grade two, um, um, and his performance status had sort of slipped from a zero to a one, but still relatively okay. So how would you think about this docetaxel uh, refractory or pre-treated patient uh, with some peripheral neuropathy remaining? Well, you know, it's, it's interesting here. We, we really have progression of the disease because at baseline you didn't have any liver lesions and now you do. So you really have progression on docetaxel. In addition, you have the neuropathies. So I'm gonna be reluctant to go to another taxane. I think in my practice, this is an abiraterone or clinical trial patient. Certainly if he goes on a clinical trial, we have to explain to him about the availability now, the FDA approved agent abiraterone. In all likelihood, that patient goes on abiraterone in my practice. Yeah, and one thing that I would add, um, there are a number of clinical trials, as you mm -hmm. mentioned, in this setting. To me, one of the trials that I like is the, the phase three ipilimumab study, which is post docetaxel radiation plus ipilimumab versus radiation therapy alone with the radiation acting sort of to release tumor antigen. I'm not sure whether for this patient I would go towards that. I would like the idea of maybe an FDA approved agent first, mm -hmm. give him some time to recover. A bradron fairly well tolerated, minimal side effects uh, if carefully monitored. So I think that would be my next step. Yeah, uh, one of the things that is kind of interesting, and I've begun to do this, so you, you take a patient who may have had some toxicity on the docetaxel, such as the neuropathy here, and then you put them on abiraterone, and they actually may become available, um, more appropriately available, for something like cabazitaxel a little down the line. So you actually use the abiraterone almost as a bridge to the next therapy, and the next therapy very well may be the other taxane, cabazitaxel. And of course, keeping in mind a lot of clinical trials in this setting, phase one trials. Mm -hmm. In addition, we shouldn't forget about sort of other palliative maneuvers, the radiopharmaceuticals. Mm -hmm. Maybe there's a new one coming out with radium-223, um, radiation therapy to bone if it is sort of focal localized bone pain. So there's a lot of things that these patients um, can have for symptomatic relief as well as their sort of anti-tumor therapy. And now just to summarize, so castration-resistant prostate cancer can take many forms. It can take early disease where patients are non-metastatic and get castration-resistant, or they can have metastatic castration-resistant disease without any symptoms, or as we just heard, patients can be symptomatic with bone pain, other symptoms, and finally, the most advanced patients that have received this sort of first-line standard docetaxel and are docetaxel refractory or resistant. In addition, um, all patients that have bone metastases should be treated with some sort of bone targeted therapy, um, both for the prevention of skeletal related events, also for uh, some palliation of bone pain and symptoms. So agents like zoledronic acid, denosumab should be considered in all these patients. And finally, palliative approaches like radiation therapy to bone, radiopharmaceuticals should also be considered for these patients. And this concludes section four. Mm -hmm.